أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Brothers and sisters, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Qala Allahu al-Azim fi kitabihi al-Kareem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa idh yaqulu al-munafiquna wal-ladhina fi qulubihim marad, ma wa'adana Allahu wa rasooluhu illa gurura. Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. This idea of information relayed which is incorrect is something which has plagued mankind from the early times. It's interesting that in the last few weeks, there's been an increase within the media regarding the topic of fake news. You have a certain politician, doesn't deserve to be mentioned by name, but an individual who's come out to say that much news about him is indeed fake. It's a excuse in order to somehow deal with the negativity surrounded by uh, his personality and his performance. Yet, at the same time, this notion of fake news is something that has gripped mankind for centuries in that you have people who emerge and somehow able to capitalize on certain situations, propagate a message, and the message is far from the truth. In Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that amongst the people in Medina were a number of different individuals who sought to somehow demoralize the Muslims in preparation for arguably the most difficult challenge they were about to face. Remember, as a quick recall, we are discussing the Battle of Ahzab, which occurred in the year five after Hijra, also known as the Battle of Khandaq or the Trench. And of course, the digging of the trench took about 25 to 30 days. And this period of time, the digging of the trench was very much testing for the Muslims because not only were they facing poverty, not only did they feel that Medina was surrounded, but there were people from within themselves in Medina who were planting seeds of discord, of fear, of dissension, and the Qur'an picks up on this. But no doubt, picks up on this so that you and I are aware that continuously, throughout generations, there are people who will endeavor or will seek to uh, do exactly the same. Now, we are told when the digging of the trench was taking place, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, was called by the Muslims because they were not able to break a particular rock. And when the Prophet of Islam came with his blessed hands and he was able to break this rock, the first strike he saw some light. And the Muslims somehow also became jubilant. They did the takbir. Second, also more of the rock broke. And finally, on the third strike, the rock, which was very difficult, and it was an obstacle to the digging of the trench, completely was opened up. And the Prophet of Islam would say to them that on the first strike, I saw uh, the land of Kisra, Persia, to be freed for you in the future. And Jibra'il told me as well that the land of Sham, Syria, modern day Syria, as well as uh, the Roman Byzantines will be defeated. And the third is that Yemen, part of Yemen, Sana'a, you will get too. Now what happened is people were very happy to hear this. And they know that when the Prophet of Islam mentioned something, it will materialize, it will happen. Yet a group of individuals whom the Quran describes as Hypocrites and those who have illnesses in their hearts. When they heard this, they came to the Muslims and said, do you really believe that we are going to remain alive after this? Actually believe that the Muslims are going to conquer land? We are too fearful to go to the restroom. 
such is such was the description that we can't even because at that time of course uh, to relieve themselves they'd have to go somewhere where nobody can see them there weren't these kind of facilities as are available today so they would go for example in certain parts or within confounds which were not visible to people so they say we can't even have the security and the safety to go to these places, let alone conquer Persia and, you know, Yemen and, uh, and Sham and so on and so forth. And therefore, they would say to people, these are lies. This is the prophet's deception. The, uh, the idea is that they are trying to make you believe something that will not happen. Now... That was what the hypocrites and the people who have illnesses in their hearts studying the Quran, that's what they were trying to do. Now, two points here. First of all, who are the people who are considered to be fi qulubihim marav? Because we know they are hypocrites, yes. Hypocrites are who? Individuals who claim to be Muslims by tongue, but their heart is opposite, is constantly uh, against the message, and therefore their actions will sometimes reflect this. But what about the classification of a group of individuals who have heart disease? Those who have illness in their heart. Now, some have said, some of the Mufassirin have said, they are also the Munafiqeen. So the Quran is saying that it's the hypocrites, including those who are weak, in their hearts. Others have said no. Some of us have picked up on an important point here. The wow, which is in, in uh, the verse number 12, as you can see, this wow is known as the wow of separation, meaning that the groups of people are being separated into hypocrites and those who have weakness in their hearts. It's not the same. They're not the same group of people. Now, you might ask, uh, what does this mean? Who are these people who are weak in their hearts or at least have a disease in their hearts? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse 15 or verse 10 says, Allah says there are individuals who already have the prerequisites for sickness of the heart and Allah makes them ill more within the heart so he adds to their heart disease so to speak this is of course not related to the physical heart but indeed to the dimension of the nafs known as al-qalb the Quran f focuses a lot on the idea that the individual the soul can also suffer from a disease just like how the physical organ does too. So for example, we have the idea of the darkening of the heart. Yes. There are hearts which become incredibly hard and darkened. And there are reasons the Quran tells us why such a uh, unfortunate development happens in the life or in the spiritual uh, existence of the human being. Very interestingly, if we look at the Quran and to summarize, so that we identify or diagnose the condition before we fall into it. Because today, unfortunately, you know, sometimes heart disease, as far as the physical condition is concerned, it's not easy to diagnose unless there are symptoms that lead to it, or at the end might lead to problems such as a heart attack and so on. Whereas as far as the soul is concerned, it's even more difficult and it's a requirement for believers to continuously search and self-scrutinize and ask, am I suffering with the condition that the Quran is speaking about? The Quran tells us in chapter 5 verse 13, فَبِمَا نَقْضِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ لَعَنَّاهُمْ وَجَعَنَّا قُلُوبُهُمْ قَاسِيَةً Allah says just because they violated the pact with God, we sent we withdrew our mercy from them and we made their hearts suffer with darkness or we somehow made it hard. In other words, they ignored their obligations. They violated the covenant with God. They did not, for example, enjoin the good and forbid the evil, which is an obligation for each and every believer, yes? 
Because of this, then there is a, a gradual worsening of the situation of the soul. Likewise, we find in the Quran as well as the narration, such as from Amir al-Mu'minin, peace be upon him, which says, "Ma jaffat al-dumu' illa liqaswat al People ask, why is it that I'm unable to shed tears, for example, due to the fear of Allah or in Muharram or in situations where you find people weep? Why is it that I don't cry? Amir al-Mu'minin gives us a beautiful uh, prescription and tells us why. He says, the eyes are dry because the hearts are hard. وَمَا قَسَتِ الْقُلُوبِ إِلَّا لِكَثْرَةِ الذنوب. And the reason why the heart is hard is because of excessive sinning. It's because of the fact that sin after sin is somehow placed and there's a layer that is formed that makes it quite difficult for the light and for the guidance somehow to penetrate. And therefore, it's of the utmost importance we emphasize that sometimes you and I, when we slip up as far as sins are concerned, to seek istighfar straight away, not to wait for a particular day or a certain time of the year or a certain place Sometimes you, fi you find people say, next year, next three months time, inshallah, I'm going to hajj. I'll ask for forgiveness then. Or I'm going ziyara next week. I'll ask my tawbah then. Number one, we don't know if we actually will survive till that time. And number two, the existence of the sin within the setup of the soul is problematic. The, the more it exists and is carried by us, the more it's embedded within our setup, within our Naf, so to speak. And that's why we have a beautiful hadith from the Imma alayhum salam that says, Tuba liman wajada tahta kulla dhanbin yawm al qiyama astaghfirullah. It says, May Allah bless and give uh, uh, eternal success to the one who, on the day of judgment, in their book of deeds, when they read their book, uh, beneath each sin, there's a statement which says, astaghfirullah. Sin isn't necessarily deleted as such as we discussed last week, but due to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be forgiveness as long as there is genuine repentance. So sinning is also another cause for the uh, sickness of the heart. Interestingly, uh, there is a narration from the Prophet, a peace and blessings be upon him, which states, مَنْ كَثُرَ طَعَامُهُ قَسَى قَلْبُهُ Whomsoever excessively eats, their hearts will suffer with disease. And this interestingly applies to both physical and spiritual illnesses, isn't it? That excessive eating is a problem. And the Prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny, gives a beautiful uh, similitude. He says, the uh, likeliness of the heart is like that of a plant. If you overwater it, it dies. So if you eat more than what you require, then you're causing uh, this, unfortunately, debilitating spiritual uh, illness. Likewise, at the same time, uh, excessive talking is being mentioned in Islamic teachings as a reason or, an, or a way in which the heart develops this condition. Uh, Do not speak much other than the remembrance of God because it causes the hearts to harden according to the narration of the Ahl al-Bayt. Of course, without the remembrance of God doesn't necessarily always mean the actual remembrance per se by saying Astaghfirullah, Alhamdulillah. Anything that is said for the sake of Allah and for the sake of serving mankind in sincerity in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Is in itself dhikr to a certain degree, isn't it? But vain talk which isn't it for, in that purpose, excessively causes these, this condition and more. Yet, there are other ways in which we can tackle this, but these are mainly the points to keep into consideration. So that's the first point about this verse. Second is, what is ghurur? Uh, in Islamic ethics, ghurur is defined as an individual being overconfident and feeling a sense of false promise due to lack of knowledge. So it is one of the traits of human beings displayed by the arrogant and those who are uh, egoistic in their uh, conduct. 
Uh, the Quran uses the word ghurur in many occasions. For example, in chapter 82, verse 6, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem. O oh, human being, why are you deceitful before God? Why are you trying to deceive? You think you can deceive God? And subhanAllah, Allah uses not bi rabbikal muntaqim or al jabbar. He says, bi rabbikal kareem, your Lord who is so merciful. You try to deceive God, but He is merciful. He reciprocates in that way. Yet, people try to do so. Likewise, uh, there is a beautiful narration from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, with regards to ghurur, with regards to this feeling that sometimes you see what others do, and it gives you a false sense of security. That's ghurur. Okay, but others are doing it. Sometimes I speak to some of our brothers and I say, you know, are you waking up for fajr? They say, I'm struggling. I say, why? You know, no one else in my family wakes up. So it's, it's not possible. Or my friends don't do so. But everybody does it. Yes. So you speak to people and you say, why, for example, there is a, an act that is being committed? Normally, or sometimes the excuse is, well, I, I, everyone's doing it. You know, it's not a big deal. I'm not the only one. Listen to what the Prophet of Islam says, according to the narration in Mizan al-Hikmah, volume 5. He says, لا يغرنك ذنب الناس عن ذنبك. Do not allow this ghurur, this self-conceit, self-deception, to penetrate your heart through comparing your sin with the sin of the people. Meaning, constantly saying, well, you know what? At the end of the day, I sin less, or people do it anyway. وَلَا نِعَمُ النَّاسِ عَنْ نِعَمِكَ الَّتِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ Don't be uh, somehow overconfident just because you have something and others don't. And works like vice versa too. If others have what you do not have, do not necessarily enter into that self-conceit mode. وَلَا تَقْنُطْ وَلَا تَقْنُطْ النَّاسِ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهُ وَأَنْتَ تَرْجُوهَا لِنَفْسِكَ The Prophet says, do not ever go to people and give them uh, somehow uh, lack of in inspiration or no encouragement to ask for mercy of God, yet you yourself are seeking it. You yourself are desperately wanting it. Meaning that do not be a negative source for people. Constantly be positive and uh, invite people towards God. Don't put them off. Often, what happens as well with human beings is that we look at what others have, or even if it's good, for example, they have, mashallah, righteous children, or we see them as good people, good human beings as far as akhlaq and staying away from sins and so on and, and concerned. And even that, when we come ha somehow be start to take that as there must be something special, is also considered ghurur. Listen to this very interesting narration from the commander of the faithful, peace be upon him. This is his wasiyya to Kumail ibn Ziyad. He says, Ya Kumail, la taghtarra bi aqwamin yusalluna fayutilun. O Kumail, don't be deceived by a group of people who pray, yet they prolonged, they prolong their prayers. Their sajda is very, very long. Their salah is beautiful. Their recitation is amazing. Don't be deceived by them. Deceived in the sense that don't think they're okay. Everything's fine about them. MashaAllah, everything is going well for them. Yes? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, don't think that. And they're constantly fasting. MashaAllah, this person, I always see them fasting. It's amazing. There must be someone who's great. They in, or you see people giving sadaqah and being kind to people. Then Imam says, why? They're going to be held accountable. You cannot judge an action, of course, or judge a book by its cover. Neither can we look at people and say, yes, there must be great individuals just because they prolong their prayers and they have beautiful voices of the recitation of the Quran or they fast all the time or they seemingly give sadaqah. And that is why. And why you might say, but this is straightforward. But you know, this is one of the most common problems we face in the Muslim Ummah today. 
Why? Sadly, Muslim Ummah sees a particular country that is looking after or has forcefully taken over the uh, custodianship of the two holy cities. Yes. And they see, mashallah, recitation of the Quran, Qurans being published, distributed uh, to the world, Hajj, and so on and so forth. Look, they, they must be good. Yes, everything must be good. Whatever they say, as far as the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan, will take. Yes? Wow, they're looking after Mecca and Medina, aren't they? Right? Likewise, when you speak to, you know, at the beginning when Daesh or ISIS came about, this was also a problem. Today is changed amongst our brothers and sisters. Muslim brothers and sisters, when you speak to them, they say, brother, mashallah, long beard, recitation, Quran, khilafah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. They want to establish a just rule, yes? They give people money, yes? They've removed all the borders. That's how it is. That's how it should be, they say, yes? So this deception by appearances, this deception by how people speak, how people recite, how people somehow put on some kind of Act in the name of Islam is a very common feature that the Quran as well as the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt constantly highlight and warn that you know do not necessarily immediately come to a conclusion with regards to this and understand the ethos, understand the spirit, understand the aqidah, the ideology, look at the package all together, not an action which is isolated. Yes. So not just all oh, their salah is brilliant, but are they truthful? Not just their fasting is amazing, but are they reliable? So on and so forth. Now, this verse highlights the existence of two groups of people, therefore. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites, and those who had weakness in their hearts. Some ulama say that this weakness of the heart would lead to hypocrisy eventually. So it's the uh, foundation or the beginning of nifaq. It's the beginning of uh, leading a, a dichotomous life, so to speak. Verse 13, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala now describes another group who existed in Medina and another way in which they sought to demoralize the Muslims. وَإِذْ قَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ Now, the Quran wants us to understand who the true mu'mineen are, wants us to appreciate who the weak believers are, wants us to know who are the wavering ones are, wants us to highlight who are the ones who have weakness in their heart, who are the hypocrites and who are the extreme hypocrites. You'll see that in Surah Al-Ahzab, Quran speaks about all of these levels. And it's up to you to pick it up, you know, to see, okay, you know, look at the degree of Iman and the degree of hypocrisy that the Quran here is describing. Here is another group, وَإِذْ قَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ A group of them. So is this the same as the hypocrites and those who have weakness in their hearts? Possibly, but it highlights a group who were distinguished with a certain characteristics. What did they do? They would say to people, they would say, oh people of Yathrib, this is not a place for you to be. In other words, digging the trench, preparing to fight. Go back, run away, save yourself. Yes. That's one group of people. Then the Quran says, وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمُ النَّبِيِّ Another group, they had an, another excuse. What the story according to the narrations tell us is that a group from uh, the tribe of Bani Haritha came to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, and said, our houses are the beginning of where this tribe known as Ghatfan would come uh, and attack from the eastern side. And it's not protected properly. Our houses are quite weak. They're fairly exposed. They say that our houses are exposed. How? Well, either the weak construction or there is a small space between the wall, the walls of the house and the... Or, or, and the entry point or where the enemies would come in. So they'd immediately see these particular houses. That's how they claimed. 
a man by the name of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, the companion of the Holy Prophet, who was amongst the heads of the Ansar, came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I bear witness that they're lying, that their houses are not awra. Now, in Arabic, awra, normally in, in, in the Arabic language, awra refers to or comes from ar, something which brings shame or disgrace. Sometimes it's referred to uh, as, uh, or as used to describe the private area of the human being. Yes, al-awrah, that must be concealed and fully uh, covered in salah, for example. Yes. Uh, here they say that we are ashamed that we have areas in our houses or in our complex, so to speak, which exposes us to the enemy and therefore we can't fight. Excuse us. We don't want to fight. Yeah. In yuriduna illa firara. Quran says they just want to run away. They're not interested in fighting anyway. And this is an excuse which has been necessarily exposed. Now, what does Quran tells us about this group? This group of people, they are looking for any reason not to obey God. They're looking for any loophole. They're looking for anything that perhaps can give them a way out from the wajib. Wajib at that time was jihad was to fight for the sake of Allah, to protect the Holy Prophet, to protect Medina, and therefore they, as a group of individuals who were there, they had this covenant with the Holy Prophet and they had to fulfill it. But they were looking for ways out, looking for any excuse. It doesn't really need us to talk about how some of us in this day and age, we look for the smallest excuses to get out from uh, our obligatory deeds. Um, sometimes we justify it and shaitan justifies it for us. Shaitan makes it something more and more uh, appealing somehow. Uh, take the example of hijab. You find that sometimes some of our sisters, when they uh, discuss hijab, they say, well, in this day and age, there is a lot of negativity associated with the dress code uh, of Islam for ladies. And therefore, uh, I don't feel strong enough in fact, one of the very uh, interesting and one that I've heard personally from quite a few sisters, uh, and I've researched this for a particular uh, lecture which I did last Muharram, why our sisters take their hijab off. One of the reasons they say is that we are not doing it for God. We are doing it for others and therefore we won't wear it. It's not sincere. I'm just doing it because my parents told me to adorn the hijab or because I feel bad in society or in my community and therefore I should not if I'm not really wearing it for the right purpose look at the justification this is a justification yes this is shaitan coming to them and say you know what who are you doing this for do you understand why you're wearing it is there pressures upon you that justification to get out of an obligation exists within many different uh, human beings. And the Quran gives us here an example. Another interesting point about this verse is the fact that this group of people came to the Muslims and, and they said to them, Ya Ahla Yathrib. Interestingly, the city of Medina is referred to in the Quran as Medina and also as its previous name, Yathrib. Yathrib was its name before the migration of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. After the migration, it was known as Madinatul Rasul, the city of the Prophet. Thereafter, because the city of the Prophet, Madinatul Rasul, was quite long for people to say, it was shortened to Medina. So that's why today it's known as Al Madina. The luminescent city, Al Madinatul Munawwara. Yet, before the migration, it was known as Yathrib. There are other names also given to Medina after the migration Tiba, Taba, Al Mahbuba, and so on. Yet, why does the Quran say they said Ya Ahla Yathrib? For a number of reasons. First, they wanted to use the pre Islamic name. They're telling people, by the way, it's going to go back to Yathrib. We're kind of sure. We're surrounded, 10,000 people are coming, we're finished. We're going to have to name it Yathrib, yes? Or it's possible that they are actually telling individuals that we're not accepting the new name, it's just simply as we haven't accepted a lot of other things within the faith. We're stick, still sticking by the 
uh, old name that was known for Medina Tul Munawwara. Verse 14 says, The Quran says, if these individuals, and here maybe he's talking about all the hypocrites, all these different classifications of individuals who refuse to stand and support the religion of Islam and the Holy Prophet. If these individuals were invaded and attacked from different directions and they were then told, you must renounce the faith and you must denounce Islam and practice monotheism, they would have embraced it immediately. They would immediately accept it. That they would not have hesitated except for a short period of time just to somehow get their uh, um, acts together somehow. Now, what is the word fitna here referred to? Yeah. The Quran uses the word fitna more than 60 times, 6 0. Yes. Um, generally, fitna in the Quran refers to a test. A trial, an examination. حَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Surah Al-Ankabut. Allah says, I'm not going to leave you just to say I'm a believer and won't test you, won't examine you. Okay? So fitna in the Quran generally means examination. Yet, in certain instances and examples in the Quran, it refers to a specific test and a trial which the Quran gives the context for. So, as an example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 193, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ fitna. Fight them so there is no fitna. The Mufassirin say here, fitna means polytheism. So fight them so that polytheism does not uh, become uh, the, uh, the kind of system that rules, or the system that people are overpowered with. Here is also in reference to the same. It's polytheism or, or the idea of apostasy. Yes, These individuals who have claimed that they are Muslim, they will turn their back against Islam at the earliest opportunity when they're confronted with the ultimatum. Oh, would you denounce faith? They would. Yes. ثُمَّ سُئِلُوا الْفِتْنَةَ لَأَتَوْهَا وَمَا تَلَبَّثُوا إِلَّا Biha illa yasira. Yes, in the school of Ahl al Bayt, we have the belief in taqiyya, dissimulation, yes, whereby if your life or if the community is in danger, then there are provisions within the Sharia law, as mentioned in the Quran, the safeguarding of the life to conceal faith, as Ammar ibn Yasir did and was not in any shape or form reprimanded by the Prophet. He was himself quite um, disappointed when he was tortured and he had to mention the name of the idols. Yet the, that, yet the Quran tells us that he mentioned it by tongue, but his heart was what? Submissive to Allah and it was a completely believing in Tawheed and nothing else. That exists. Taqiyya as an option definitely is there. But the Quran here is saying, not that people are somehow safeguarding their lives, but individuals who can't wait for opportunities to turn their back against the faith. As soon as they're put in a difficult situation where they're told that you have to uh, renounce the faith, they do so willingly. And that is actually their aqidah. That is actually their belief. That is what they seek to establish and do. Now, the Quran now, as you can see, is describing their, quality, their characteristics one by one. What would they do? How would they respond in certain situations? In different instances. وَلَقَدْ كَانُوا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ مَنْ قَبْلُ They gave God a pledge before. Who? Who gave God a pledge before? These people. The hypocrites, the ones weak in their heart, the ones who are given excuses about where they should be, or their houses and others who would not fight. 
Allah says, but hold on, they had given me a pledge. He had given me a promise. Now, when and where? Where was this promise given that the Quran says they definitely had given this before? Some say it was this Bay'atul Aqaba. Bay'atul Aqaba is when the people of Yathrib came to Mecca, some of them, and pledged allegiance to the Holy Prophet and said to him that if you come to Yathrib, we'll support you. They met him in Hajj in Mecca, and this happened twice. There's a Bay'at al Aqabat al Ula and Aqabat al Thani. It happened twice, and therefore they pledged that they would support the Prophet of Islam. So maybe the verses are talking about the fact that their covenant was established then. That's number one. Second, some have said no. It is the pledge they gave the Prophet after they ran away from the battle of Uhud. Because an important factor that unfortunately uh, caused the Muslims to retaliate and somehow be defeated in the battle of Uhud two years earlier than this, which gave the Mushrikeen, which gave Quraysh and the tribes that had come with them together, the confederation, so much hope that they would completely obliterate the Muslims in Islam was the fact that companions of the Prophet, a good number of them, ran away from the battlefield. Now, you might say, are we individuals that have the ability to discuss this? Is this actually uh, something that is agreed upon by all Muslims or not? I would like to draw your attention to Sahih Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 59, Number 611. Okay. So it is considered a Sahih book by many of our brothers and sisters. And it talks about a particular battle known as the Battle of Hunayn. The Battle of Hunayn happened in the year 8 after Hijrah. So three years after the Battle of Ahzab. When did it happen? It happened after the conquest of Mecca. And the Muslims, there were approximately 12,000 in number. They were huge. Not like here. In Ahzab, there were 3,000 facing 10,000. Battle of Hunayn, there were quite a few. And in fact, that got to them. They began to think that that's it. They're sorted. Their numbers are... And the Quran kept telling them, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. But they, unfortunately, they would not understand this issue. Yes? So, there was ghurur within them. Yeah, we'll be fine. Yes. They were confronted by a tribe in the area known as Hunayn, just outside Mecca. Right? And so what happened was that tribe was very well prepared. And when they attacked the Muslims, they attacked them and they had ambushed them actually. They were hiding behind trees and so on. They ambushed the Muslims. According to most reliable Sunni historical narrations, out of the 12,000 who were fighting with the Prophet, how many remained with him? 12. 12. That's it. Only 12. When was this? This was so many years after Badr and Uhud and, and conquest of Mecca and Ahzab. Yes? It is towards the end of the life of the Holy Prophet. People say, well, I don't understand. Why? Well, how can 120,000 see Ali ibn Abi Talib's hands being lifted? Man kuntu mawla, then only a handful support him. Well, only a few years before, 13,000 were with the Prophet and only 12 remain. It's not a surprise. It's nothing to be surprised about. Listen to this narration, which is said in a completely academic, rational way from the uh, Imam al-Bukhari's compilation. The narration says, Muslims, except the Prophet and some Sahaba, that's the narration says, started running away from the battle. When? Which battle? Hunayn. And I too fled. This is one of the people who's narrating this. I fled with them. He said, when I was running, I saw another person also running. And I looked at him, and he was the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab. I saw him running. And I saw, said to him, what is wrong with the people? He said, it's the will of God. It's the order of God, rather. It's the order of God that we should all run away. So what happened was prominent companions had deserted, had left in Uhud and in certain other uh, instances and so therefore the Quran says well maybe you broke your uh, allegiance that you had given after you'd run away in Uhud and said to the Prophet we will never let you down again and now you're letting him down however 
These are specific instances of the pledge. It is more likely to be a general ahad, which I'd like to draw your attention towards, yes? The Mufassireen talk about the fact that the Quran speaks about this ahad, wa bil ahad. Quran says in Surah Yasin, Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam. O oh, Bani Adam, O oh, the sons of Adam, did I not take this covenant away from you? Have I not taken this promise from you? Yes. They say this Ahad. The fact that this Ahad of Allah is essentially faith, essentially submission, essentially belief in Islam. Why? The moment an individual testifies to the oneness of Allah and that there is no deity to be worshipped other than him and that the final and the greatest of messengers is the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. That in itself is a ahad, is a covenant. You've signed it. Yes? Now, within that comes terms and conditions. And these terms and conditions, the Quran is saying that you may somehow break throughout your lives despite giving that promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is where sometimes some of our practices we need to take a take a moment to reflect because uh, there is incredible pressure to conform to what others are doing in society why can't I be doing what this person is doing why can't I be for example um, getting to enjoy myself in this particular way, like how others do it. Why not? Yes? Well, you know what? We have subscribed to a particular set of instructions, a code, a constitution. That subscription is for our own salvation. It's not that, you know, somebody's benefiting from it. It's us and us alone primarily who are the beneficiaries of this covenant that we have signed with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it is likely that the Quran is here referring to the fact that they are Muslims and that when they disobey Allah and the Messenger, they are breaking their covenant with God. And it's a hefty statement. Every time an individual disobeys, they are somehow breaking this covenant with God, breaking this pledge and this promise. And of course, the emphasis at the end is وَكَانَ أَحْدُ اللَّهِ مَسْؤُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this covenant I'm going to be holding you accountable for. I'm not going to take it lightly. Yes, I'm going to be questioning you over it. Now, Quran then rebukes them in verse number 16. It says to them, do you think by running away, you know, you and your deceitful um, objections or ways that you have somehow convinced yourselves, the excuses, the turning away from God, you feel that by running away you're saved? That somehow you're okay? You know? Uh, it's interesting because in our lives, sometimes when we um, feel the need to go outside, so to speak, the realm of the Sharia law, we feel we've got away with it. Nobody's watching, no, well, Allah is watching, Allah asks for maghfir, Allah asks for istighfar. Yet the key thing the Quran is saying to us is, you and I, every time that covenant is broken, there are repercussions. There are things that we have to be taking into consideration, or we may not necessarily feel, feel them. Have you been in instances where you've lost your keys? You look everywhere and you can't find your keys. Or you're, you've had a really difficult day. Nothing seems to go according to plan. Yes. Uh, you're supposed to meet somebody somewhere and they're waiting for you somewhere else. And you call them, aren't you here? They're here and so on. And you get frustrated. Why? What, what, just why did this happen? Yes? Individuals such as, for example, you know, we feel for them. Those who were about to travel to the United States last week on Monday. You know, one of the worst days to travel to the U.S. when the ban actually started. 
from those seven countries. And perhaps they were, you know, thinking, well, shall I travel the week before? And they decided to go on that week. And then what happens? They would then say no, and their visa was somehow revoked or whatever. Then they, would may, they may have canceled their plans or canceled their flights, and then the ban was lifted again. So imagine, you think, why did it happen to me? Why didn't it happen to anyone else? Everything that we and I go through is for a reason, and partly is because of sins or the disobedience and the breaking of the oath and the covenant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you're going to have to feel and go through some repercussions of your actions. And this will happen in this world before the hereafter in many instances. Many instances, that is how we uh, begin to understand them. And this ghurur need to, we need to get it out of us. I recall um, there's a very interesting story of a king by the name of King Shaddad. This king apparently was the king at the time of Prophet Hud. And uh, this prophet of God had come to him, inviting him to monotheism, to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, he had said, okay, if I do that, if I worship God and not the idols, what am I going to get? What are you going to give me? So Hud said to him, Allah has promised paradise, which has palaces, which has rivers, which has fruits that you cannot even imagine, begin to imagine. He should describe them. So as the Quran describes for you and I, Jannah, in the way that we'd understand it, but at the same time, wants us to appreciate that it is just for description purposes and the sweetness and the profoundness of it is much, much, much greater without the ability or the comprehension of the human mind, which is limited in this world, but it needs to be uh, described in a way so that we are eager or happy to take or to work for it, yes? Just how, you know, the Quran tells us there will be rivers of honey and rivers of milk. Does it appeal to us in this day and age? Does it? You know, to say to someone, if you say to a non-Muslim, God has promised paradise and you get so many, you know, uh, rivers and you can drink milk all the time. Like, you know, I'm not really interested in milk, to tell you the truth. Yes? That, that's why, you know, when we speak to people, we have to speak to them to the level of the, their inte intellect. When I was speaking to children, I said to them, you can have rivers of chocolate. You can have rivers of whatever you like, correct? The Quran tells us honey and milk because at that time, honey and milk was a big commodity. Something everybody sought. There was no chocolate at that time. I don't know. I'm just making this statement. Allah knows best. But that is how we understand it. And therefore, Prophet Hud would say to... Uh, this individual, this king, that you will find this and this. So this king who was so arrogant, so deceitful of himself, that he decided to build paradise on earth. He said, I'm going to build that paradise that you talked about. And therefore, he consolidated, uh, you know, the, his, his wealth, brought them together, people. For many, many years, he began to build a city which the Qur'an refers to as Iram, the city of Iram, Iram Adhatil Ibad. Yes, Iram apparently was some stunning city which had things which people could only imagine. And this individual said, I'm going to create paradise here, enjoy it here. Why should I, you know, necessarily work hard and get it in another life? Let me, you know, enjoy it in this life. So he began to build and he sent apparently hundreds if not thousands of workers to that area and so on and so forth. When it was time to open up this so-called heaven on earth, of course it's not come anything compared to paradise, but he and his entourage made his way towards that city. Apparently it was a few hundred kilometers away. On the way, according to the riwayat from the Ahl al-Bayt, he saw a deer, some deer, you know, and he was really um, somehow infatuated by the deer, he wanted to capture it. So he followed the deer with his horse and everyone else could not c catch up with him. So he got lost. He got lost in uh, where, wherever the deer went, in the gardens, in the farms and so on. He did not know where his entourage were. And all of a sudden he finds someone. According to their narration, he looks at the person and says, can you help me? He says, there's no more 
help. He says, what do you mean? He says, I'm the angel of death. I've come to take your soul away. He says, but I have paradise to go to. Can you give me a few minutes? Or, you know, just let me go to that city I've built all my life. I've invested all my life. He said, You're not even going to get a chance to dismount from your horse. And his life was taken away. Yes, and he died. And he lost this world and akhirah. Yes, such is, such that the ghurur can influence human beings. So, قُلْ لَنْ يَنْفَعَكُمُ الْفِرَارُ إِنْ فَرَرْتُمْ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ أَوْ الْقَتْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if you run away from the battlefield, even if you run away from your obligations and your duties and your responsibilities, this uh, fleeing is not going to help you. Because what is the worth of this life? You're going to somehow feel a sense of disgrace. You're going to uh, eventually come to death, which is ajlun mahtum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set the time of death for you. So by running away, so in this instance, of course, they were running away from the battle because they wanted to save their life or they thought that, you know, by not fighting, they'll live longer. So they're afraid that if they fight, they'll die. Allah says, but Allah has prescribed a certain time for you to live. So whether you go to the battle or not, you're going to die at that moment. It's not going to change now. People ask, but we have narrations that says if you give sadaqah, your lifespan increases. If you do salatul raham, you enjoy good relations with blood relatives and family, your lifespan increases. So how could the lifespan increase if the Quran here <coughs> is saying, your time is set. The reason is there are two set times for each and every human being, according to the understanding of some ulama, which makes a lot of sense, Quranically. How, how do we view it? One is an ajal which is flexible, and one which is an ajal, a time, set time of life, which is fixed. So, for example, a person like me is given an ajal flexible, which is 60 years, and one that is fixed, which is 80. So I could live anywhere between 80, or between 60 and 80. If I visit relatives, if I give sadaqah, if I perform salatul layl, then I maximize my possibility of living up to 80. But if I don't do that, then I get closer and closer to 60. That's how it works. But whatever I do, I will not surpass the 80, if it's 80. Of course, only Allah knows my cap, so to speak, yes? So that is what the Quran is saying. You know, that cap, you're going to get to it. That ajal, you're going to get to it. Whether you um, fight in the battlefield or not. قُلْ مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَعْصِمُكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِنْ أَرَادَ بِكُمْ سُوءًا أَوْ أَرَادَ بِكُمْ رَحْمَةً who can protect you from Allah if Allah wants you to go through difficulties, hardship, or will engulf you with his mercy? Now, this style of the questioning in the Quran is a rhetorical style, meaning Allah asks the question and what? And gives the answer. Yes? So normally the answer is in the question or is somehow followed. So for example, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Allah says, have we created, do you think we've created you in vain and that you're not going to return back to us? That's the answer. You're going to return back to us. I haven't created you in vain. You're going to be held accountable. You're going to have to answer for what you did. Likewise here, the Quran says, that do you think that anybody can protect you from God? What he wants for you to happen? Either good or bad or to grant you mercy? There is no way that you can find a higher authority or helper other than Allah subhanahu what is this verse trying to say to us? It's trying to say that whatever happens in our life, it is certainly, most definitely, no doubt about it, observed and Allah subhanahu by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and within the plan of the Almighty Jalla wa'ala. Therefore, 
Do not ever, for us, a message for us, do not ever place your affairs or think that it is others who bring the bad or the good, so to speak. Without the permission of God, it will not happen. Yes. In the realization that a believer submits to a factual uh, plan of God, which is that everything happens for a reason. Either it is a punishment or it is a test. And therefore, nobody other than the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to assist. And this brings us nicely to the challenges that some of us face in the West in that we find that we think the answers lie with alternatives to Islam in order to give us some kind of respite from what we're going through. Yes. So as an example, somebody says that, you know, in order for me to get up to company ladder, to one day maybe become the chief executive of my firm, I have to go out with them to the pubs, to the clubs. I don't drink, but you know, sit with them in the same table, socialize, because otherwise I'm excluded from this so-called very important time where many things happen. So for me to get to that, I need to be able to do this. Yes. And other similar examples exist. Allah says, do you think that you're going to get that position without Allah allowing it? And so if you go against God, do you think he will give it to you? He might give it to you as a punishment. But if he doesn't give it to you and you have obeyed him, it's mercy. And it works in both ways. He might give it to you as mercy too. And he might not give it to you as punishment. And there is no way of knowing. Yes? But the key thing to appreciate the Quran is telling us that when it comes to these decisions, when it comes to these important choices in life, in our day-to-day -day interactions, in our day-to-day -day decisions that we make, don't place God as what's outside the equation. He is above the equation. It is he who decides, not anyone else. And so placing our affairs in his hands and trying our best within the remits of what he has allowed us to do will certainly help us. I think I've mentioned this in the past. We'll end with this, that um, uh, a brother once was uh, seen to be praying in the warehouse in his company. Uh, because there was no place to perform his salah. So they started to spread the rumor, I'm not sure where it was, perhaps in the States or in other countries. And they spread the rumor that, look what he's doing, you know, this is scary, we don't want him to do this prayers here. So the manager came to him and said, look, I, I, I'm sorry, you can't pray here. You, you can't do your prayers. He tried to find other ways, you know, in the office somewhere, there was nowhere to pray, yes, in the workplace. So he decided to leave, decided to leave. And incidentally, a brother told me this actually as well in, in America, that he was um, uh, due to go to Hajj, it's wajib upon him, but his company said, no, we don't want you to take leave. He left, I'm not saying you should, because sometimes our ulama give the permission that you know if it get, is going to cause you excessive harm, financially, for example, then you should not. Yes, but he decided to leave and he told me himself, yes. Same to this person. He left the company, he left the position because of prayers. He said, my last day was Friday and I had given him my notice before. And on Monday morning, I received the call from a better company for a bigger position and a much better pay. You trust Allah, you'll see the difference. That's the motto. Allah says, you're going to do it for me. I will help you. I will make your situation better. You might not see it to start off with because I want you to go through a bit more. But eventually, I will take you out from that difficulty and I will give you something much, much, much better. In this world, yes, it will happen in this world, most likely. 
and Allah knows best. Sometimes it happens and we don't feel it. Sometimes because we've been given a ni'mah that we don't necessarily appreciate, where others don't have, and we have. Yet we say, why is Allah not treating me nicely? You know, why is he not dealing with me? Why is he not giving me what I want? But he's giving you other things. But we're not necessarily cognizant of it. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq, to be of the individuals who are grateful and who are submissive to the will and the commands of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahumma ala muhammadin wa alihi wa tawheerin.